welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade, and today I'm joined by Colonel Michael Zulsdorf. How you doing, sir? I am doing awesome, Colin. Thanks for inviting me to come to the show. No, absolutely. Any opportunity for me to talk to you, learn from you, get some free mentorship from you is a great day for me. It's a great day for me to reconnect with you. I was pleasantly surprised when you reached out to ask me to do this show. You guys are you and Reed are legendary on this show, and you guys are making some some great inroads with all of our young Air Force and DOD leaders that are out there who listen to your podcast. So I am grateful for this opportunity to share some of my thoughts on this. Well, you know, when Reed and I talked about doing this series and knowing that we were going to read broadcast this particular episode about the foundation of character, which of all the episodes that we've ever done, this is among one of my favorites. Yeah. And I knew that we were going to want someone to provide commentary on it. I, th- I thought to myself, who is the person that I want to provide that commentary? And my mind immediately went to Michael Zulsdorf because <laughs> of all the people that I have met in the Air Force over the course of my career, there are a few who really stand out as people with truly impeccable character. That's how I have always thought of you is someone who just, you shoot it straight. You don't cut corners. You're an incredible airman. You love the Air Force. You want to do right by the Air Force, by your people. And you are just like the right person for me to provide this commentary. Well, I appreciate all those accolades there. You know, I think to some degree, you're absolutely correct. I've had this opportunity to be a leader now as in command positions six different times. But I will say that every single command has been a little bit different. And I've grown from every single command that I've had. And my perspective of character has also, while it's been a foundational tenet of my success, I will say that even that has over time morphed a little bit. And if you want to talk a little bit about that, that's, that's fine too. I think, I think as we mature as senior leaders, I think we need to leave room for some of those foundations to, uh, you know, you're a civil engineer background. Yeah. Some of those foundations every now and then need shoring. Some of them need to be moved a little bit so that the overall building can carry that weight. Right. And so that our institution is held up by this thought of character of our leaders and character of our airmen. But even that needs to be shored up at times, which probably, frankly, is a little bit about why General Goldfein, the previous chief of staff of the Air Force, thought about it that way, right? And he wanted to reemphasize that. Yeah, I love the analogy here. And who better to speak to it than a civil engineer? (laughs) Um, But before we get to the episode, the rebroadcast, before we provide any more commentary, let's give you the opportunity to introduce yourself a little bit more to the audience, explain to them who you are, where you came from, how you got in the Air Force, why in God's green earth did you choose to be a commander six different times? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no worries at all. So for those not tracking, Mike Zulsdorf, I'm just a small town boy from Wisconsin. You know, I grew up out in the country. I loved everything about growing up in the country as, as most kids do. I, you know, I grew up in a time when you could go outside for the day and stay out all day and mom wouldn't even worry about it twice. She knew you were coming home for supper. And when you got home for supper, you know, there was a plate on the table and we were loved and nurtured. And, and it was just an awesome opportunity to be a kid. I joined the service initially because I knew I wasn't ready for college. Uh, so Okay. I joined it a long time ago in 1986. I was enlisted for seven and a half years. Wow. Uh, all of it at Tinker Air Force Base, um, which okay. was uh, an experience in and of itself. Very different from Wisconsin. Very different from Wisconsin. That's right. But, you know, when I was there, 
my intention was only to stay in for four years, like so many other young men and women who join our service. You know, I wanted to get the GI Bill and then I thought I'd be ready for college. But as I was there, I started to recognize that this was an institution. This was an organization that I could see myself being in for a very long time. Yeah. You know, we talk about integrity and service before self and excellence and all we do. And we were living that mantra, even as a young airman, I was learning what that means to do that. And so I just fell in love with Big Blue. You know, I knocked out a couple of associate's degrees and the University of Oklahoma called me up and said, hey, we have a scholarship for you if you're interested. Took me a little bit to to actually choose that path because I didn't really know if it was right for me, but I decided to go ahead and take it. And I haven't looked back since. I've been, um, I was fortunate. I was a civil engineer enlisted. I was able to get back into the civil engineer career field because I love civil engineering and what we do from an installation support perspective to enable mission sets all across the world. Yeah. And so I just wanted that opportunity to lead. And so, you know, multiple stops along the way at the base level, uh, did my MAGCOM duties at Air Combat Command. You know, then I went up to the Pentagon and I've been in this whole national capital region for the last, since probably 2009. So for the last 12 years or so, I've been in and out of the Pentagon four times. I've been a two-time squadron commander, a two-time mission support group commander. I was the Air Force element lead at Joint Base Anacostia Bowling. And then I took that over when the 11th wing moved from Joint Base Andrews back over to Joint Base Anacostia Bowling. So I was the 11th wing commander too. I think honestly, I'm the only airman that I know who's been uh, a civil engineer squadron in the 11th wing, a mission yeah. support group commander in the 11th wing, and a wing commander of the 11th wing. So pretty unique. Which is pretty awesome. <laughs> and that's where we met. That's right. My first assignment in the Air Force was to the 11th wing. You were my second commander. Yes. But the commander that I had for the longest period of my time while at Andrews. And let me tell you, sir, Watching you lead and learning from your example was one of the prime reasons I fell in love with being an officer. Awesome. And I could not be more excited to have now introduced you to the audience. We're going to get to the rebroadcast here and then to keep the mics on and let you teach me, teach Reed, teach the rest of the audience, anyone who wants to listen about how important character is to being an officer and to being a commander. Yeah. I'm stoked. I'm stoked. Yeah, this is going to be good. This is going to be a good rebluing for me too, I'm quite sure. So I'm looking forward to it. All right. So we'll turn it over here to the rebroadcast and we'll catch you on the backside. Let's round out this discussion that we've been having about what the Air Force values in its officers. When General Goldfein published this memo to his wing commanders, he outlined the four things that we value, executing the mission, leading airmen, managing resources, and improving the unit. And then he said, these core competencies all ride on a foundation of impeccable character. Now, interestingly enough, those four values all come from AFI 1-2. They're outlined explicitly there. However, one will search in vain for guidance or any sort of official AFI that fully outlines what is meant by a foundation of impeccable character. Now, we discussed this a little bit back in our very first episode released in September on what is an Air Force officer. In that episode, we cited AFI 36-2005 for officer accessions and the requirement for officers to be of, quote, sound moral character. And I lamented at the time, Reed, if you remember, that AFI refers primarily to criminal activity and drug use. But I don't think that is exactly what General Goldfein is after in describing what the Air Force values in its officers. So I'm asking here again, and I think that's where our discussion needs to be today, is what is meant by a foundation of impeccable character beyond crime and drugs? What is it that the Air Force is looking for? What do you think, Reed? I think it's a great question. And as I was doing research for this, and I know you stumbled upon the same thing as we were kind of looking into this, I found myself on the Air Force Academy's main website. So usafa.edu. And right at the top, in one of the most top line, you know, if you look at the website in the hierarchy, right, you've got the homepage, then you kind of have the most important subjects that are linked on that page. And one of those topics, one of those tabs 
is character. And you go to this character tab and the Academy has an entire center focus on this idea of character. And it, it really, you know, it's interesting as I think about this idea of like, what is character? Because it is foundational. It is completely, I mean, it underlies everything we do, yet it shouldn't even need to be addressed because it's foundational. You know, it's there. It's always there. It's like the earth we walk on. We don't think that the earth is there or really always consider it, but it is always there. And it's one of those things that we do need to speak about a little bit because it is the foundation of what we do. Yeah, in that website, the Air Force Academy defines character as, quote, one's moral compass. Some of those qualities of moral excellence which move a person to do the right thing despite pressures to the contrary. What do we think of this definition? I like it. It's also highly circular. Um, you know, your moral compass and then uses moral excellence further on in the definition, you know, so it definitely is one of those things. I feel it's like that famous example where when speaking of illicit material or graphic images, uh, you know what it is when you see it. And we've kind of used that reference before, but I think you know what character looks like. You certainly know what a lack of character looks like. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is even if you don't necessarily know what right looks like, you certainly know what it looks like when there is an absence of character, when somebody certainly has it wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to go through some examples here. And, and I think that'll clearly define what wrong looks like. I do like the last bit of that definition where it says, move a person to do the right thing despite pressures to the contrary. I think to me, that's really like the next level. That's this place where we really want to be is there will be pressures to not be excellent, to maybe not always give your full effort or to hide or to not step up. And some of my most important experiences I've had as an officer in the Air Force is watching leaders, despite pressures that would normally cause people to shrink, but to stand up and just take whatever came, you know, and I've got, you know, one in particular I recall uh, we were at OTS, a graduation went very poorly. We had a very high level visitor. We got a lot of distinguished visitors at OTS. When officers are commissioning, it's like bees the honey, you know, officers love to be part of other officers, graduations and promotions. It's fantastic. I really, truly enjoyed it. We had a very, very important visitor and the graduation wasn't bad, but it was not good. And it certainly did not meet the standard we were used to. And the group commander who I worked for at the time, I mean, the grass isn't even come back up right after being marched on. I mean, we had just wrapped up graduation. And he told me to go find the squadron commander and everyone who was in charge of graduation, he wanted him in his office immediately. And I knew this was going to be a fun conversation. And he was very displeased. I gathered up the folks and that squadron commander stood in front of 12 or 13 of his people and said, sir, I failed to achieve air superiority. I did not do what you asked me to do. And he just completely took it. And to me, that was character. He could have turned and said, well, yeah, this guy did that and that girl did that. And yeah, they sucked. But no, he absolutely said, no, this is my mission. I'm the officer in charge here. This was mine and I'll own it. And I think to me that idea, despite the pressures to the contrary, you don't want to take that shot in the face. You don't want to do that. But he did. And I think that's something that I definitely keyed on as I was going through this research. Yeah. What you're describing there is a leader of character. And the Academy website defines that further for us as someone who lives honorably, consistently practicing the virtues embodied by the core values. And I think that's one of the things that the squadron commander in your example displayed there is integrity, that he recognized that there were mistakes made. And those mistakes very well may have been made by people that he had delegated authority to. They absolutely did. You know, the, the squadron commanders got a lot going on. And yes, absolutely were delegated tasks. Right. But the squadron commander had the integrity to realize that ultimately responsibility falls to him as the commander. That is how things should be. So he had the integrity to say, hey, this is on me. Yeah, he could have said, this person was wrong, this person was wrong, this person was wrong, but he didn't. I don't think that 
that's what the group commander was looking for. I don't think he wanted to hear a elicited out explanation of everything that went wrong. I think he just wanted the squadron commander to take ownership. Yeah, it was hard to know because, you know, in one degree, I could see the group commander being frustrated because we weren't getting to actual solutions because we weren't addressing specifics, right? Instead, I found, you know, the squadron commander almost leading up, if you will, and diffusing the situation, giving the group commander an out, saying, got it, sir, you are unhappy, we'll fix it. And then I'm sure he went back to his squadron and they had another heart to heart where they actually got down to the nitty gritty. But that interaction showed me what character looked like. Yeah. And I wish it happened more often. Sometimes it doesn't. But boy, that was a great moment for me to see that happen. And I told that commander so. I wanted him to know how much that meant for me to see someone to just stand up and take it like that. Yeah. So again, you're describing another core value, service before self, leading up, taking the blows instead of putting your airmen out in front of you and watching them you know, get reamed by a group commander. He stood there and protected his people. Yeah. Now, like you said, he probably went back and had that heart-to-heart tough conversation with the people that failed, but he didn't do it in front of leadership. Yeah. Now, it was a great thing that I remembered as we were talking about it right now. Continuing on with the Academy's definition of a leader of character, it says, lifts others to their best possible selves. And then finally elevates performance toward a common and noble purpose. So I think what the Academy captures here is is a good start for what we're looking for with regards to this foundation of character. As I explained in our first episode, I'm, I'm not fully solidified on my own personal definition of character, just as the Air Force doesn't seem to have an official definition of it. But here are some thoughts of what I think right looks like, what should be part of someone's character. I think it's necessary that they have some sort of moral code or ethical center. Now, this may come from a religious background. It may come from a study of philosophy. It may be just the way that, that's the way the mama raised me, you know? But I think that there has to be something, some sort of set of principles that a person can look to and say, These are my guideposts. These are the things that help me make decisions about what is right and what is wrong. I think that has to be in place. Now, that goes against what seems to be more and more popular in world today is this idea of moral relativity, that what's right for one person is up to them, that you don't get to project your morality on other people. But I think that as an officer in in the Air Force, that is a requirement that Whatever your moral compass is, moral code or ethical center is, you have to project that onto the mission, onto leading your people, how you manage resources, how you work to improve the unit. I think that is central in all of that. I think that's something that will become a natural growth from effective training, especially at basic training, ROTC field training, and at officer training school and USAF and these other initial accession sources. Because you're going to be tested and you're going to be evaluated against right and left posts, I think those without those moral guideposts tend to fail. That was my experience as an instructor. Those who had moral relativity did not last long in training because we were giving them right and lefts and telling them where they needed to be. It sounds cliche, but our core values absolutely can be those things if you don't bring those already with you to the table. Yeah, totally agree. And those without those did not succeed at OTS. Another one that is on my mind with regards to character is that someone needs to have some sort of conviction or passion for pursuing the good and the true. Now, what do I mean by that, Reed? Anyone who wants to be an officer in the Air Force needs to be looking for things that are good and not just good. We need to be looking for things that are better or best because the world is full of all sorts of good things and we can fill up our lives with just good things, but we don't have enough time. We don't have enough resources. We don't have enough energy to just pursue the good, but we need to seek after things that are of the most good, things that are better and best. And in addition to that, we need to look for the things that are actually true, that are rooted in reality, that are fact. In our previous episode, You explained how to know if something is right or how to do the right thing. And 
you explained that you can know that something is right if it is repeatable, reputable. And what was the last one? Transparent. You can do it in a transparent way. That's right. And I think that is a great way of looking at truth. Is it something that is repeatable? Is it going to be the same in every situation? Is it reputable? Is it something that we seek after? I think that kind of goes along with being of the most good. And is it transparent? Is it something that you feel comfortable sharing with other people, especially your airmen, the people that you are trying to lead? I think that it's really important that an officer in the Air Force pursue the good and the true in that regard. What do you think, Reed? No, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that what you're getting at this pursuing the true, I think we've talked about multiple times how important it is for an officer to be able to accurately and consistently assess self to know where you are relative to right in order so that you can continuously improve yourself. And I think that this is consistent with that. Not only do you have to be true to yourself and understand where you are, but you have to continue to look for that elsewhere around you. And that comes from a culture, from a belief, from a perspective. It's not something that you achieve. It's absolutely something that you have to be. Yeah. My last thought here on this idea of character is I think an officer needs to have genuine care for their people. In my previous episode, I I described this as being a father or a mother figure to your people, a genuine love for those people. But at the same time, having that professional distance in that you are requiring these people to do some things that are not necessarily what they want, but is ultimately for their good and for the good of the mission. I don't think this is necessarily the case everywhere in business, in the private business world, but I think that out in the business world, the bottom line is pursuit of profit. That's kind of the idea of capitalism is pursuing more money, more revenue, more production, more efficiency. But we in the Air Force have to view our people as a resource themselves. And we have to treat that resource as something of the utmost value. They're not just cogs in a wheel. They're not just gears in a machine. They are our most precious resource and we need to protect them. I think that's one of the most important responsibilities an officer is to take care of their people. And so I think part of character needs to be that genuine love and that genuine care for the people that they lead. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And again, in that story I shared earlier about that squadron commander genuinely caring for their people. Yeah, totally agree. Reed, do you have any other ideas, things that you would want to add to this idea of character that the Air Force values that we need to have in our officers? No, you know, like you, Colin, this has been a tough one for me. You know, I've really given it a lot of thought and The more I think about it, the more I come down on this idea that it is so foundational that it's hard to look at the earth, you know, again, using the earth as this idea of a foundation and as something that's just always there. It's hard to look down at the ground and understand and capture it all because it's so big and vast. No, I think you did a really good job of covering it. I do think, you know, this outward focus that you have, you know, as started with that last one, focused outward towards the success of the mission and that of your people. Yes, you have to take care of you, but if you're too self-centered, I don't think that's character. You know, you can have good morals, good ethics, pursue good, but it be all about you. And I think that's the only thing I'd really add to your list here is that it's directed outwards. You know, again, fulfilling our, our core values of service for self. I think that's the one thing I would add. Yeah, absolutely. My cadets have heard me say this time and time again. It's not about you. It is about the mission and it's about the people around you. Yes, you do have to take care of yourself. You have to be proficient. You have to be capable, but it is not about you. Yep, that's one of my favorites as well. All right, Reed. So we kind of have this idea of character, at least something that we can work with. But now I want to talk about this idea of of it being a foundation. Now, a foundation is something that you build on. If you think of it in terms of construction, the foundation is going to be your strongest material, your heaviest material. It's the thing that goes at the bottom. Usually 
in construction, it's going to be some sort of concrete that is buried deep under the ground, or maybe you use pylons or something that is anchored deep into the bedrock itself, into the earth, as you mentioned. So with this idea in mind of a foundation, how is it that character is a foundation for officership? How is it that this idea of character kind of, you know, as the academy describes it, you know, living honorably, lifting others, elevating performance, or as I'd kind of defined it, having a moral code or ethical center, a conviction or passion for the good and the true, a genuine care for people. How do these different principles, these different elements enable an officer to execute the mission, lead airmen, manage resources, or improve the unit? What do you think there, Reed? I think it centers on the idea of trust. I think it centers on that concept almost alone. When men and women sign up to join the Air Force, they are, in every sense of the word, entrusting their lives to this organization. And as part of the organization who's responsible for leading them, they are truly handing us their lives. And if they do not trust you, we have lost. And I know that sounds really melodramatic, but that is what it centers on for me. It's all about trust. And that comes down to small and simple things, right? Like if I'm flying in formation, I trust that my wingmen have done the training to the level required for us to not crash and die. I trust that the security forces airmen guarding the gate are trained sufficiently that they are doing their job so that I can do mine. I trust that when I ask a question of an airman, that they're going to give me a true statement enough that I can act on that to make decisions or to inform combatant commanders. Can you imagine if we worked in an organization where a four-star general who's making life and death decisions didn't know if they could trust the advice they were getting? Can you imagine working in that kind of environment? I simply could not do it. That is why it's foundational. It is all about trust. You know, when the students arrive at OTS, lots of yelling, lots of screaming. And one of the first things that happen when they meet their flight commanders, we have what's called flight commander welcome. And that is the moment for you as the flight commander to kind of lay the ground rules, the context and background for how you like to teach. You know, is your moment to give an elevator speech that really mattered, that kind of set the class on the path that you wanted it to go. And one of the first things I told them is that I inherently trusted them because they had raised their hands, swore an oath they were wearing the same uniform as me. And I had to trust them unless they gave me reasons not to trust them. And I think that's what it starts with. When I see someone across the way and they're wearing the same uniform as I am, I inherently trust them. I have to, or else we simply couldn't operate. What are your thoughts on that? I think you're hitting it right on the head that if you can't trust the people around you, it makes it very difficult for you to do any of the things that the Air Force requires or anything that we've described as the things that the Air Force values. If you don't trust the people to your right and to your left, your ability to execute the mission is significantly decreased. If not your ability, certainly your motivation. But you don't want to be there because you, you feel like you're in danger, you feel like you're not safe, or you're just like, these are not my people. This is not my tribe. And I don't want to be around them. I want to be with my people. I want to be with my tribe, my family. And I think you're absolutely right. Trust is central to all of that. It makes me think about Secretary Powell, Colin Powell. There's a YouTube video out there of, I think it's called like Colin Powell on leadership or something like that. And there's a news reporter who asks him, you know, what does he think about leadership? How did he become the leader that he is today? And without missing a beat, he immediately responds, it's about trust. And I'm not going to you know, completely quote the video there. I'll post it in the show notes, link it in the Facebook group, and we can discuss it there. But the way that he describes trust as it relates to being an officer and being a leader in the military, I think is exactly what we're looking for. That if trust is in place, because there is that character in place, then as he says, people will follow you, if only out of curiosity. 
No, that's great. You know, in my experience, especially at officer training school, right, we're deliberately creating environments and purposefully evaluating people on this. This was a pass-fail assessment. If I did not trust these airmen, they were not going to be airmen. That was the bottom line. Not just airmen, but not leaders of airmen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They're civilians. They weren't going to be officers. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very few times did I observe anything that actually was a violation of trust, a loss of integrity. And when they did, they were quickly escorted out. A lot of times, you know, a lack of integrity wasn't the root cause. A lot of times there were miscommunications, misunderstandings, sometimes technical problems and honest mistakes. You know, sometimes people make mistakes and that doesn't necessarily mean they lack integrity and, you know, have violated trust. I do have one story I want to share. And this happened while I was a student, just to kind of paint the picture of how seriously we take this. So when I was there, and I'm going to be deliberately vague to, you know, protect some folks, but I'll do my best to kind of share the story, but I think I can communicate the main principles. There was a set of electronic equipment that was used to monitor parts of the campus. And the students at the time, we were kind of manning this post, if you will, you know, kind of part of our duties, you know, just one of those things you do at basic military training, you man posts and you run things. And there were two students that were manning this location. And they had been given specific standing orders not to touch this specific electronic system. Very clear, very understood. I mean, it's literally posted on the door of this bit of kit. Like, under no circumstance will any students touch, monitor, do anything to this. Just leave it alone. At the time, it wasn't working. And one of these two students before officer training school actually worked for the company that built and installed this system. So they were literally a trained professional on the system. And one of the students, knowing that they could fix it, broke the standing order, got into the system, and fixed it. An instructor came by, noticed that the system was working, right? That's good, right? We solved the problem, but knew that it must have been a student who had done it. That's not good, right? Because there was an existing standing order not to touch the system. So the staff member confronted the two students in the room. And this is probably the most interesting part. Asked both of them, did one of you touch the system? And the student who had repaired it said nothing. The student who was in the room while it happened, but didn't say anything, said, sir, I watched another student touch the system and I did not stop them. Now, which of those two is displaying character? It's clear, right? It's the student who knew that a rule had been violated, even though they didn't do it and owned up to that. The staff member could tell something was going on, interviewed both of them again separately, and only after the second interview did the student say, yes, sir, I touched the system. But the damage was done to that person's integrity. And that person was not invited to continue with training. So just think about that, right? We have a system that's broken. Someone solved the problem, but in doing so, they lied basically by not saying anything. They lied about their involvement and allowed another person to take the fall for them. And the way that worked out gave me confidence and hope that I was joining a program I wanted to be a part of. And I think that's one thing that has really stuck with me is... This is so important. It is a go, no go criteria for officership. It is absolutely essential. And the only times that I really started to question someone's ability to be an officer in the Air Force when I was an instructor at OTS was when I saw things that made me question whether or not I could trust them. Yeah, I'm with you, Reed. My experience has been that very few officers I've interacted with in the Air Force have lacked the character needed to be in the Air Force. I think that is one of the wonderful things about our organization is that the default is that you can trust them. You may know nothing about them. You may have never worked with them. You just arrived on station five minutes ago, but you know that you can trust the people that are around you because it is so fundamental. It is so foundational to what it is that we do in the Air Force. But I have to ask Reed, if everything is built on this foundation of character, where does failure as an officer occur? 
are character flaws as the lack of character or lack of specific parts of the character that we have tried to describe the source of mission failure is character flaws or a lack of character, the source of poor leadership, the source of fraud, waste, and abuse, the source of stagnation within a unit. What do you think about that? If character is so foundational and central to every success that we have, is it also central to every failure that we have? What do you think there? I'm going to vote yes. Put me down for one yes, Alex. (laughs) Yes for 100 Uh, What is yes? We'll continue with this theme. So I think let's go back, you know, to our earlier discussion on what the Academy defines as character. The sum of those qualities of moral excellence, which move a person to do the right thing, despite pressures to the contrary. If you are failing to use resources appropriately and you are fraud, waste, and abuse, there was some sort of pressure likely to enrich yourself or an organization that you are associated with or someone else that you care about and you failed to do that. That is, to me, a failure of your moral compass. And so I do. I think that, especially the types of failures that tend to make the front page of the Air Force Times, you know, these wing commanders and and others that are getting fired and very high-profile type of failures, those things to me tend to center around character faults where they have gotten misguided or ego has gotten in the way or any other number of things. I have very, very rarely seen a true lack of competence lead to mission failure. It has happened. It is very uncommon. And that is understood. I have seen people give their honest best and that best not be good enough the reaction to those types of failures is entirely different than when someone tries to hide or tries to cheat or tries to skirt around or not do the right thing. Very different reactions. And I do think that it is the source of most significant failures of leadership. Well, just picking up your failure due to competence, as an officer, your responsibility is to organize, train, and equip your people. And if they are failing, It's because you have failed to correctly organize them, train them, or equip them. And that failure is then, if we're in agreement that mission success or mission failure comes from character, your people's failure is because of a failure in your character and your responsibility towards that organization, training, and equipment of your people. I tend to agree, largely. A couple things I do want to throw out. Enemy gets a vote, right? If an aircraft gets shot down because the enemy was better than we are, I don't necessarily think that's a failure of character, right? That led to that mission failure. So let's throw that out there. Enemy gets a vote. There's fog and friction and, you know, a number of other things that can lead to mission failure. And I think we're on the same page here. But what I'm getting at is when there is a failure that is not necessarily caused by external circumstances, right? You have observed someone trying to perform the mission and they're honestly giving it all they've got then yes, I do think that someone put them in that position to fail. Sometimes that's not the case, right? They've gone through the training, they've passed, maybe it was close, and maybe they just don't have that stick to or that perseverance necessary to deliver. You know, I remember deployed, watching someone who had been through the exact same training I had, done well, but was unable to perform in a very stressful situation. That's a hard thing to train and evaluate for when they did fine in training. But when it came to game day, that was a different thing. And because they were working and really trying, that was a little bit different than, oh, someone must have pencil whipped your training, you know, because we all knew that that hadn't happened. So yeah, but I do think a lot of the biggest mission failures can be traced back to people who have decided to mail it in at some point. Yeah, I agree with you. I like how you explained it, that the enemy gets a vote and that fog and friction, these external factors will play into mission success, mission failure. Sometimes we just get lucky. And unlucky. And unlucky. Yep. But even the best luck will not overcome a lack of character. And sometimes having character in place can overcome even the worst luck. Yep. I'll totally agree with that. Can we say it that way? Is that? I think so. Am I putting myself way too far out there or? 
No, I agree with that. You know, there's a guy I worked with at OTS. It's, um, he was a big advocate of saying that the best led military will win the next war. And I, I think that's oversimplified, but I also think there's a grain of truth there. Sure. And I think that's kind of what we're getting at is this is so fundamental and so central. And I know we've said that over and over again throughout this episode, but it must be stated over and over again that this is the starting point. There is no other starting point than this trust, than this foundation of character. And again, I want to emphasize for our audience, I have overwhelmingly experienced very positive things in this arena. Some of the darkest moments in my Air Force career have been when I felt that this wasn't in place. I hope that doesn't happen to any member of the Air Force. It likely will again. And I hope we continue to get better and root those kinds of things out. But I hope our audience has, you know, taken this circular discussion that we've had today about the importance of character. Yeah. So if we're in agreement that the source of mission success or failure can at least be somewhat influenced by the presence or lack of character, then there are a couple other questions that are on my mind that I don't know I have good answers to. First one up, how do we train for character in our commissioning sources? Are we doing a good job? Are we doing it right? How can we do it better? I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Or are we just expecting that the necessary character traits needed for mission success are already in place when our cadets show up? Yes to both, question mark, right? It's tough. These are tough questions. I think, well, keep going. You've got some more questions and then I'll give my thoughts. Yeah, so then in combination with that, once our cadets have commissioned, they are now officers in the Air Force. How do we continue to develop their character? Is it something that is trainable? Is it something that can be developed? I believe it is. So how do we do that? Or do we think that character is set, that your moral foundation, your moral code, your ethical principles are set and they don't change and you just carry them with you through your entire career? Yeah, for me, again, this is not the panacea, but I think what we do is we reward examples of good character, we highlight them when we see them, and we savagely punish those of lacking character. And I think that is how we do it. And to me, what I find is that some of the biggest sources of concern or consternation or frustration that I hear amongst my peers is when they observe what they believe to be someone with a lack of character somehow skirting by or even, you know, hopefully not, but sometimes getting rewarded. And those who seem to be doing the right thing, not getting recognized for that, or maybe even punished. And I think that is the right way to manage it. And if we create a culture and an environment where it's just simply expected, I think that's the best way to do it by rewarding those who do it right and getting rid of those who do it wrong. Who gets to decide if we're doing it right? I think we've had this conversation, right, <laughs> Colin? That's what makes us a profession, those of us who are in the club. But who's to say that those of us that are in the club have it right? I mean, are, are we saying that character is relative? The type of character that we are looking for is specific to the Air Force. I don't think that I have a good answer for these questions. Yeah, I don't either. But I do know that we're in at a time when leadership is asking these exact questions. And again, that just gives me hope. I'm in the right place when someone else at the very top is asking that exact question right now. This whole memo that we've been talking about for the last four or five weeks all centers around this idea of, hey, I don't think we're getting this right. And that gives me hope for the future. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of where I was hoping to end up with this whole discussion is that just as we don't have the answers, but we're looking for them, so are our leaders at the highest level of the Department of the Air Force which now includes the Air Force and the Space Force, are looking for these answers. How do we ensure that the people that we bring into the service and those that we keep in the service are meeting our requirements that, that have the characteristics and the traits that we value in an Air Force officer? I like the way that the A1, Lieutenant General Brian Kelly, I like the way that he likes to put it, that he is... 100% confident that we don't have it 100% right. Yeah. But that we're working toward it. 
Yeah, I saw him say that at uh, in the recording of the Air Force Association conferences last year. Yeah, that's great. I think that that requires some extreme humility and it is a demonstration of character at the highest level of what it is that we're trying to do here. We're trying to find the best people and keep the best people. Those that have this character that are able to execute the mission, lead airmen, manage resources, and improve the unit. That's the whole purpose of this entire memo. That's the whole purpose of this discussion that we've had over the last two months. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't emphasize it enough how exciting a time it is to be in the Air Force and now the Space Force for some of those who were ceremoniously made part of the Space Force by the signature of our Commander-in-Chief. Exciting times, Colin. Yeah, so I'm with you, Reed. I'm super excited. We're both really excited. We hope that you, our audience, are really excited about what 2020 has in store for us, the, the years that will follow as we move forward in our individual careers, as you move forward in your career as an officer already in the Air Force or the Space Force, or as someone who wants to join this profession. We encourage you to stick along, stay here with us, be part of this discussion. Join us in our Facebook group. Come tell us what it is that you think about what it means to have character and how it is foundational to these other things that we're trying to accomplish as officers in the Air Force. We would love to have that discussion with you. We hope that you will share this information with other people who are similarly interested or engaged that they can learn from you, learn from us about what it means to have character. And we can encourage each other in our efforts to execute the mission, do these things that the Air Force needs. Anything else you want to say there, Reed, as we wrap up this discussion about General Goldstein's memo? If you want to become part of history, come on over, talk to a recruiter, get your package in. It's one of the best things about being in this job. And uh, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Commissionette. All right, sir. So the audience now has had the chance to listen to our discussion, me and Reed talking about the foundation of character. We shared some of our thoughts on what character is. Obviously, you like the analogy of character being like the foundation to a building. Yes. And I think that is a great place for us to begin your commentary. You are a civil engineer. You have worked your whole Air Force career in civil engineering. You're doing all kinds of installation support. You've seen lots of foundations for buildings, but you've also seen lots of different officers, lots of different command. You've had multiple different commands. How is character foundational to being an officer and more importantly for our discussion here today to being a commander? Yeah, I think, um, you know, as I mentioned, character as the foundation of trust, right? I think if an officer, if you don't have that foundation of trust, then I'm not sure we're going in the right direction. I'm not sure as a commander, as I look out and across to my team, if my team doesn't have the character I feel that it needs, then I don't know if I can accomplish the mission that I've been given as a commander, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so, I look out at individuals, first and foremost, you know, I assume that there are some levels of character within each individual. I assume that I can trust you. I assume that you're living honorably and that you are working hard to elevate performance of, you know, your subordinates or whoever you are. And so that's the first thing that I go into as a commander is looking for that, that trust with each other. And then building off of that, working to try and find that home for you to fit into the organization and grow that character yourself, I think is important for us to get the mission across. So that's first and foremost, as a commander, I've got to get that mission done. And if I can't trust people to get it done, then we may have some concerns, right? Right. I think back to our time together, you know, just using you as a perfect example. Uh oh. <laughs> well, this is a good one. This is a good one because I got to be honest, you know, I knew, you know, we talk many times about fire and forget officers, right? Or fire and forget uh, civilians or fire and forget airmen. And you were somebody who I could look right at. I could give you clear direction. And I trusted that you were going to go out and execute to the vision that I had laid out, right? Um, I don't feel like I constrained you left and right boundaries too much. I just knew that you, yourself had a character that would then 
go out and try to achieve the vision that we as a squadron were trying to get to. And so that's kind of what I was looking for in all of our airmen. Did we have that within our unit? Probably more so than not, right? Yeah. I, I would argue that they don't wake up in the morning wanting to do bad stuff, right? They wake up knowing that they have a job to do and that they're going to go out and they're going to execute that job. Yeah. And that was something that Reed and I talked about in the episode is that because of the way that the accessions process works, because of how we train both our officers and our enlisted, we are able to essentially assume trust with the vast majority of airmen, both enlisted and officers. Yes. That we don't have to have this concern in the back of our head. Is this person trustworthy or not? Generally across the board, yes, there are bad apples, but airmen in the Air Force, guardians of the Space Force generally are great people. They have a high level of character. That makes it easier on the outset to work toward the mission that, like you described, I've got to get the mission done. I'm going to trust you to do it. But yes, there are people who don't necessarily fit that mold or over the course of time, they, they allow their, their character to slip. Yes. And that's where you as a commander have to help them to find their character again or develop the character that they were supposed to have all along. How do you go about doing that? Yeah. So first off, I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, that was one aspect of your guys' previous podcast that I picked up on is whether we're sending America's best sons and daughters through basic training, or they're going through the United States Air Force Academy, or we're going through officer training school, you know, or they're going through reserve officer training corps at a college or university. I think the foundational programs are there to get at building somebody who is you know, someone who has respect for some other people, who is fair, who cooperates with people, who is compassionate, you know, who has humility, right? Who has humility as a person. So those traits of a good person, I think we do a pretty good job of building. To your question on, you know, how do we help somebody who may slip a little bit? I think that's a big challenge at times. I think most people, when they slip a little bit in any of those attributes, I think there's a process in place to help correct them. I think first and foremost, they probably look at themselves in the mirror, I would hope, mm -hmm. and they catch that slip, right? That's what, you know, as a commander, that's what I'm hoping that that individual has done. They'll self-correct. They self-correct. And they do that because of the framework we've built them to do, right? That foundation that we've given to them to, to self-correct. So yeah. that's the first thing that we're hoping happens. And frankly, I'll be honest, I slip every day, Colin. I slip every day. Sure. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror. And I would argue that most people probably do. I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I'm course correcting every day. I'm trying to do that. You're shoring up your foundation. I'm shoring up my foundation, whether that's through, you know, spiritual resilience, whether that's through, you know, physical resilience, whether that's, you know, maybe having a good network of peers, having a great network of people who are my friends that I can bounce ideas off of, you know, all of that, I think helps me as an individual yeah. to keep the foundation solid, right? But when I, not necessarily me, but when somebody starts to slip past that point, then all of a sudden peers are going to pick up on that. Friends are going to pick up on that. And I'm hoping that the same friends who we've grown up recognize that. We've given them the skill sets to recognize when one of their peers is slipping and they can go in and help that person, you know, shore up their character. But if that fails, then it's going to start to bubble up through the chain command. And you're going to have supervisors who you know, I would argue we do a pretty good job through Airman Leadership School or maybe through SOS, you know, those types of important schooling opportunities that we provide our young CGOs, our young airmen, some of our civilians get the opportunity to go to these. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of stuff where they can then start to work with an individual to help them and make sure that they're grounded properly so that the individual in questions character doesn't affect the overall mission because that's really what this is about. Yeah. You know, we as human beings, we've been given this awesome responsibility to our nation to execute the mission. And we have to do it off of this very foundation of character that we're talking about right now. So, yeah. And it's good that you established that there is a process, there is a way for 
deviations from the character that we need to get identified and addressed among airmen. But how is it the same? How is it different for commanders who start to slip? Because we've all heard about the toxic commander, the toxic leadership environment. And how do those things get addressed or how do they not get addressed to the point where a commander will eventually have to be removed right. because they've lost the trust needed to lead? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, knock on wood, in six commands, I've never had to relieve anybody. However, I have watched it happen to one of my peers when I was a squadron commander at Joint Base Andrews. Yeah. And so, you know, in that particular, I don't know all the details because they don't share all the details, but when a commander loses faith in a, in a like as a wing commander loses faith in a squadron commander, it's not because it happened overnight. Right. Normally, normally. It's usually a pattern of behavior that has been attempted to be changed and it has not been changed. And that individual, for whatever reason, just didn't have it in them to change the behavior that had created this loss of confidence. I saw it much more. So I was the 3-2-E, which is the civil engineering career field manager. And I saw a handful of our civil engineer squadron commanders get relieved of command for various reasons. I think though, you know, when people think of a squadron commander being relieved of command, it's not always character-based. There are definitely, you know, character-based relieving of commands that happen, but okay. a lot of it that I saw was more so of not being necessarily responsive or not knowing where to go to get resources or just not being ready quite ready as a commander in some other skill set that they probably could have been ready to go. So first, I just want to, I just want to caveat, make sure that everybody understands that, you know, there's many ways to get relieved of command and rarely is it the character one, but when it is the character one, then that is not good for the unit. I think uh, that definitely affects the morale. Um, people see through the fact that the commander is untrustworthy. I think people see through the fact that they needed to be removed because of how they are how they are maybe treating people and how they are not fair in the processes if that makes sense it does i have to push back if you don't mind uh, that's okay this is what this is all about i'm all good i would expect nothing less <laughs> i would expect nothing less <laughs> <laughs> oh sir you know me so well that's right so reed and i did talk about in the episode how my thought is that Whenever there is mission failure or failure of someone to accomplish the thing that they were given, be it an airman, be it a commander or whatever, that it can always be traced back to someone's lack of character. So, for example, you gave the example that a commander could be relieved because they just weren't prepared for command. Well, why weren't they prepared? Well, in my thought process, that's because somebody who was their leader didn't prepare them. Perhaps. And so there is a failure of character there. Someone didn't do their due diligence. Uh, I think you can always point it back eventually to somebody, but I'm willing to be wrong on this. Yeah, no, I think this goes back to your guys' podcast, I felt. This is me pushing back on you, by the way. Okay. Your guys' podcast was awesome, and I think it was necessary with regards to the very foundation of character and making sure somebody is doing their job, right? Yeah. Which is to your point, somebody is should be understanding their job and knowing how to do their job. And then somebody above them should be training that individual to do their job, right? Is that, that's kind of what you're, I think that you are, might be getting at, you and Reed were getting at. Yeah. I would argue in command, command is a very gray area. Okay. Very great. And you are constantly balancing and walking that tightrope between leading people and all the things that come with people, all the different challenges that come with leading people. People are messy. And people are messy. They have challenges themselves and executing the mission, right? And so there are certain skills that an individual needs that are people messy skills that you don't learn. You 
sometimes cannot understand or comprehend until you're sitting in the command seat holding that flag. Yeah. And so that's where I would push back on, you know, I mentioned maybe a little bit earlier about how my six different commands have matured me. And I still have a long way to go, by the way, (laughs) have made me see things that I never thought that I would see as a person and in people, right? Yeah. And it's not because necessarily that people have failed in their character. And it's not because somebody has failed somebody else and not done their job preparing somebody. It's just sometimes you just don't have all the skill sets you need to be able to address how to motivate a civilian, yeah. how to motivate a person, how to fully understand what that person is thinking or even what that person is going through or even to empathize with what that person might be going through personally because you just haven't lived it, right? Right. Or you just haven't experienced at yours and Reed's level yet because you guys are you guys are definitely in that theory piece yeah. which is really what this center for leadership this character leadership i think what usafa has like it's a heavy heavy theory yeah. but until you get into the practice of command and are able to understand that role of leadership and bring in the character of that into your leadership model and your paradigm i would argue that the perspective is not there and so Back to your point, I would push back on you a little bit on, I don't think it's completely foundational in that regard on some instances. Yes, it's absolutely there. And yes, it needs to be there. And the absolute framework needs to be there. But you got to find the gray, I guess, is what I'm saying as a commander. You have to find that gray to continue to keep and invest in people who we've spent a lot of money on to create the skill sets that we need from these individuals to execute a mission that we have to protect our nation. And if that makes sense. It does. You guys had a good example of, I think Reed may have provided one of the examples in that previous podcast where, you know, we had somebody who he was going through either basic training or some kind of OTS training or something. And he'd been given specific directions to, you know, not do something. And I remember this airman decided to take it upon himself to be innovative because he had experience in this as a civilian. He came in, I don't know if you remember that as that part of the podcast or not. Yes. He worked for the company that produced this piece of equipment. So he knew he could fix that piece of equipment. Yes. But he was explicitly told not to. That's right. And so I immediately honed in on that because Reed, I think if I remember the storyline, that individual ended up being removed out of Big Blue. Yeah, for an integrity violation. For a, quote, integrity violation. Okay, okay. And so I guess where I'm going, and I immediately thought to myself, hey, if I'm a commander, I understand that somebody in the chain may have said, don't do that, right? Mm -hmm. But as a commander, before I would have kicked that individual out, I would have done the due diligence to find the gray in what that airman innovatively was trying to do for our service and solve something that was decentralized and then bring in that fix back to big blue. Does that make sense? It does. So I honed in completely on that one as a great example of between the theoretical approaches of how we grow the left and right bounds of our airmen. And then today as a commander, how I would have tried to open that aperture up to not only save this airman, but then find a way to recognize that airman for solving a problem based on a skill set or an experience or a level of diversity that he or she may have had to come back to my unit and enable the fight. I really like the perspective that you're bringing to it. Obviously, we don't know all of the details. Maybe there may may have been a little bit more that that went into why that potential officer was released. That's right. Um, But as I'm hearing you talk about the gray area and doing your due diligence, the phrase that keeps coming back in my mind is to lean into the gray, Mm -hmm. to find the gray, as you put it. And so much of what I understand command to be is dealing with ambiguity, that you don't have a perfect answer for every problem that comes across your desk. And Mm -hmm. then sometimes you just have to make a decision with the limited knowledge that you have, with the limited experience that you have, and try to do the thing 
that is best first for the Air Force and then second for the airmen and the other people involved. Right. Yes, that's great. That's exactly what I tried to do in all of my commands. You know, largely based on my experience, you know, I've been a CGO, I've been an airman. So I've seen examples that were not so good of leaders who didn't quite find the gray. They were really, really black and white. Yeah. And it just, what I have found with the straight black and white leaders is it's really difficult sometimes to allow the freedom of maneuver for an airman to be creative in their problem solving and to be able to unleash that potential that may be existing inside of somebody to get at it. And so that's one thing, you know, I just kind of honed in on that as a young airman, as a young CGO and told myself that I really needed to find my own self to find the gray more and, and get at how to be innovative and flexible. And so I think, you know, even before we started talking about innovation and flexibility, you probably saw a little bit of that in me as a, you know, squadron commander at at Joint Base Andrews. Mm -hmm. Um, But back to the concept of, you know, character, I still feel like my own foundation of character was pretty solid. It's not ever perfect, but it was solid enough to where I was comfortable to be able to get at that gray, to find those nuggets within the gray and and lead the squadron to success. And again, it was that foundation of, you know, integrity. It was the foundation of, you know, trying to do things for the best of the unit and still execute the mission. So, yeah. And I like this way of thinking about it as well, that character may not necessarily be a foundation, but maybe it's an anchor that allows you to explore the area around you a little bit. Oh, that's great. A little bit more without being tossed about by the waves of adversity and uncertainty. What do you think about that? I think that's a fantastic analogy. Well, it's definitely in parallel with, you know, the foundation I was talking about with that, because that anchor that you're describing is still spelled the same way, you know, character It's still spelled the same way all the way down to that acre, but it allows you maneuver room within that boundary to to handle any tempest that's coming at you. You know, you described it as adversity, but it's, there's so many other things that are out there that, that will hit you up as a commander that you need to have the wherewithal to understand what that particular thing is, what that moment of adversity is. And then as best that you can react to that unemotionally, transparently, you know, transparency is a big thing. Yeah as you deal with this adversity um, and then know who to reach out to and talk to about it, you know, right. to help calm that sea, you know, that challenging sea that you've got so that your anchor, then you can pull that ship right back directly over your anchor and be ready for the next one. Maybe it's, you know, maybe yeah. you create that stronger anchor. I don't know. No. Yeah. I like it a lot. I'm sure that the Navy folks, you know, all three oh, of yeah. them that are, that are listening to this That's are shaking right. their heads. They're like, Oh my gosh, they used them. <laughs> they used the Navy example. <laughs> Maybe what you're going to do is you're going to find that this pulls in more more listeners. You're going to have the entire Navy coming in. <laughs> I, I doubt it. <laughs> but hey, we're supposed to be more joint focused anyway. That's right. So That's gonna that, be that would be a great thing. <laughs> well, well, great, sir. This has been fantastic. I feel far more instructed. I feel like I have a better understanding. Obviously, having knowledge of the theory is very different from having experience with the practice of command. But having gone through this interview with you, having spoken with all the other commanders who have offered their thoughts in this series has been very beneficial to me. And going into this series, I was unsure whether or not I wanted to be a commander at all. I don't know if you remember. I remember uh, you guys talking about that. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you remember you and I talking about it when I was a young officer. I didn't know if it was what I wanted to do. And I'll, and I'll tell you why, you know, a little confession for you, sir. It's because I saw your example. I was like, "Mm, I don't know if I can do that. You know, here's me, here's Colonel Zulsdorf. He's, he's way up there. And I don't know if I can do that. I don't even know if I want it. Yeah. But having been through this series now, having been through this interview, I feel like I'm ready to accept the burden of command if the opportunity is presented to me. Yeah. I don't know if it will. You are describing, here's a secret. Here's a secret. I think 
all of us who have been commanders have thought those exact same thoughts that you just described. Okay. So first off, just know, just know that you are not alone. Also know that even today, Colonel Mike Zulsdorf feels that same way, right? Okay. But what I will tell you now is that having gone through it a few times. <laughs> just a few. Just a few. These hard decisions that we have to make, these hard decisions about mission, these hard decisions on where we're going to put resources, these hard decisions on how we're going to impact, whether positively or negatively, the life of an airman or guardian, all of that kind of stuff that comes with command is not unnatural for us, right? Yeah. And the key to success of any command is that you have to develop your own heuristics, your own, you know, your own little rule sets that are framed in the foundations of how the Air Force is trying to raise you to be the best officer, the best civilian, the best airman, the best guardian that you can be. And internalize that and constantly reflect on that so that when, when you become a commander, you can make the absolute best command decisions that you can and that your strong character gives you the edge because you've established this muscle memory. You've learned about this, right? You've learned how to evaluate a situation. You've learned how to ask really good questions from a whole bunch of different people. And I'm talking not only people within your own organization, but people of character in the JAG Corps or people of character, you know, spiritually in the chaplain corps or the operations group, you know, all of this big network that you've got so that you can make quick decisions and timely decisions that are based on integrity and that have the core values of our Air Force and your own core values of yourself to be the best commander that you can. And it's going to be a lot of gray but it will be, you know, framed on, you know, some left and right boundaries that our Air Force has instilled in you. And I think you, I think all the people who have an opportunity to listen to what you and Reed are pumping out, I think you guys are going to have a leg up because I really like what you guys are laying down on this podcast. You know, frank discussions about a whole plethora of things that our Air Force does, uh, the Department of the Air Force. So I'll, I'll keep it, you know, both Air Force and Space Force. Yep. But if people take the time to listen to what you guys are doing out here, they're going to be better officers. They're going to be better civilians. They're going to be better airmen. They're going to be better guardians. I'm appreciative of what you guys are laying down here because this is really, really important to develop the 21st century leaders that are United States Air Force, that are United States Space Force, and that, are, frankly, our nation counts on and deserves and expects today. Well, I appreciate the compliment, sir. The whole podcast itself, but this series specifically has been very instructive for me in showing what I know I know, what I know I don't know, and bringing to light some of the things that I didn't know I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And Rumsfeld. Exactly. <laughs> and I can see the delta that I have to cross to get to where I want to be. I don't know if I'm ever going to be a commander just because of how my career has played out to this point. Right. But I'm willing to put in the work now to try and be prepared for it as best as I can be. I mean, it's kind of like preparing to be a parent, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you can you can read all the books, you can talk to other fathers, but you're never going to know what it's like to be a parent yes. until you actually are holding that baby in your arms. You're, yeah. You don't know what it's like to be a commander until you've actually got the baton, you've got the guide on in your hands, and you're like, oh, now it's real. It's game on. That's right. Game on. Yep. So thank you for sharing your perspective, and I'm so grateful that I can count on you as a mentor and so many others that I've developed a network and, and had all these conversations with so that I can prepare as best as I can, knowing that I'll never be fully prepared. That's right. Yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, character is a very, very important aspect of command. And, you know, no one is perfect all the time. But if you can internalize that, reflect on that, understand who you can talk to, to get the support that you need, 
to learn, like you said, to learn those skill sets necessary to either raise a baby or lead a squadron of whether it's 50 people or, you know, in our case, we had 550 people at Joint Base Andrews. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's just, it all comes back to that foundation of what we've learned and how we've grown up and how we define it. You know, and when we're hitting our stride and being consistent, those airmen and guardians are going to find ways to reflect that back on you. And they're going to, they're going to tell you how, you know, as you're kind of alluding to here, how that character and those character traits that you valued in a squadron commander, how they reflected back, you know, and how you view me and how you view your other commanders that you've had and that trust that you established with them. And it's very rewarding. It's very rewarding to know that at least one of you out there that I've had the opportunity to lead <laughs> is interested in command because to your point on being intimidated by that, I, I, I swear those are conversations that I had with our CG when I was as a young CGO, I'm like, Holy cow, there is no way I want to, I want to do that gig. And then something clicks, right? Something clicks inside you that the air force put in you, something clicks to where you recognize that you are ready and that you will go out there and continue to carry that flag and be the best squadron commander or best mission support group commander or wing commander or whatever that might be in your cards someday. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to you guys a little bit about it, to share some thoughts. Again, gray, that's my parting shot. It's always gray, uh, but as much as possible, that foundational brick is there to, to help us. Yeah. Love it, sir. So if anyone wants to get in touch with you because they want to pick your brain about your six different commands, emphasis on the number six, holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or if they want to learn more about, you know, working with the Space Force you know, on the installation support and sustainment side of things, or that they want to get some more information about the civil engineering career field, how would you like people to get in touch with you? I would love for them to email me. So the best thing would be to do the michael.zulsdorf at us.af.mil. I'm here for anybody out there. And I truly mean that. I think that you can uh, attest to that. I answer the mail and I am willing to talk to anybody about any subject that you've got that you may have out there or any kind of a challenge to help you. I'm huge on mentorship, training, coaching, whatever that might be. Because honestly, I'm at the end of my career where I'm probably, you know, closer to the closer to the approach to come in for final than many that are out there listening right now. And so right. if I can help anybody along the way, you know, then I'm more than willing to do that because I believe in Big Blue. I believe in what the service and products that we provide our nation. And I believe in each and every one of you. I mean, you guys are coming in way better than Mike Zulsdorf was at that point. Way better. And I'm stoked that we have so many awesome people out there to be able to carry that mantle. So, yes, sir. I agree with you. The Air Force has the potential to be in very good hands. <laughs> it really does. I mean, it, you know, we are the best in the world and it's because of the people that we have. It's those airmen and guardians out there executing the mission each and every day and helping us out. So I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to be a player in this big game of chess just for a little bit. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, sir, one final question for you. We typically end this with a question about what it means to be an officer, but to conclude this interview and to conclude this series, what does it mean to be a commander? I think what it means to be a commander is to be able to be given the trust of an institution to carry out the mission with the teammates that were provided. I know there's a lot there that I've just said, but I am immensely privileged. I recognize that I'm immensely privileged to have been a commander and to have had the lives of our airmen and soldiers and sailors and guardians. I've been on a joint base, right? I've had all of them. I think command is, you know, you read a lot about being a privilege. I, I didn't necessarily understand that, until you know you've gone through it a few times and then you realize how immensely privileged we are so that's my biggest piece of gratefulness that i have having been in command i think yes sir well colonel michael zulsdorf thank you so much for your time thank you for your experience your knowledge being willing to share it with us 
I feel very blessed to know you, to have learned from you. And I hope that the audience now feels that as well. Great. Thanks again. I appreciate it. You guys have a great day. And that will conclude this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.